John chapter 4, beginning at verse 6, reading through verse 30. The word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah or Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man 
which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Hallelujah. I want to talk to us for a short while today on the topic from outcast to evangelist. Amen. From outcast to evangelist. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, Savior, giver of life-giving water, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to hear from the bread of life, to receive today, O oh Lord, from your Word. For in the Word of God there is salvation, in the Word of God there is healing, there is blessing, there is instruction, there is joy, there is peace. There is so much for the child of God to glean from the pages of this sacred text. Master, as the preacher of the gospel called to occupy the sacred desk, if I'm to be of any help to the people of God, I need the anointing. There's only so much this old body can do. There's only so much strength that I have. I need a touch from the Lord today that I might deliver unto the people of God a word that will inspire, encourage, help, cause our faith to grow and prosper. Touch today, Lord, my body, my mind, my lips. Touch the ear of every hearer. Allow us to receive with gladness the engrafted word of God. But Lord, more than this, help us to walk away living this message, embracing this message, and not merely hearing it and being forgetful hearers. We ask all this in none other than the wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. I know the usual point of conversation I know what preachers generally will talk about when we begin to look at the story of the woman at the well I know the sermons that are preached on the gift of the Holy Ghost I know the sermons that are preached on the acceptance of the Lord and his affirmation of this woman. I know all the high points and I could preach today a message that goes down our text and kind of hits all the high notes. But that is not what I feel instructed of the Holy Ghost to deliver to the church at this hour. I want you to understand today that in the story of the woman at the well, there were more reasons, listen carefully children, there were more reasons for Jesus to have simply ignored this woman than there were for him to be bothered with conversing with her and talking with her. This poor woman had more going against her in so many ways than she had going for her. First of all, you have to understand the patriarchal system of the Jewish people. Men did not make a habit of initiating conversation with women, uh, strange women, women they didn't know in particular. That was considered to be a no-no. That was something that you just don't do. It could be seen as uh, something that is off color and not quite proper and right. So the fact that she was a woman was strike number one. Number two, she was a Samaritan woman. She was the wrong nationality. Oh my heavens. No, the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along well. They had very different opinions. They had very different views. And they had a different religion. 
You'll notice Jesus said to her during the course of their conversation, He said, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, lady, got news for you. You're embracing the wrong religion. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. You're in the wrong faith. You're not in the right organization. You're not in the right denomination. You're not in the right belief system. I got news for you today, children. There are a lot of people that call themselves Christians today. There are a lot of people that call themselves believers today. There are a lot of people that this Sunday went to church. But that doesn't mean they're in the right religion. That doesn't mean they're in the right way, that they're walking the right way, that they're believing the right things. Oh, this lady was a woman. She was a Samaritan. She was of the wrong religion. My goodness, have mercy. There was less going for her than there was going for her. But I want to tell you something. My Jesus has a way of tapping into resources that others don't even realize exist. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, my Jesus has a way of knowing things about us that may seem trivial and small and unconsequential. But what he knows makes all the difference. And you might say today, oh, you're talking about him knowing that her current lived-in man was not her husband. That's what the preacher must be talking about. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I'll get there, but that's not what I'm talking about. No, he knew something else about this little lady. He knew something about her that was going to help the cause. He knew something about her that was going to help him do the work that he had come to do. I want to tell you something. You may look at a bunch of LGBT people and think, that God can't use them and they have no place in the kingdom. And you think you know everything you know to, uh, uh, about them that there is to know. But I'm here to tell you today, my Jesus sees something in us that you don't see. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, God is able to look beyond the externals and look upon the heart. Yes. And he knows, he can look and say, now here's the people I can use. Hallelujah. I want to tell you today, the church of Jesus Christ is so far off track. It has gone so far off the rails in this modern time that it isn't even funny. We have preachers getting up in pulpits telling their congregations that you cannot possibly be a Christian and belong to this political party rather than this political party over here. They're telling their people that God has called the most wicked and ungodly heathens among men to be a leader in America at this time in order to achieve his righteous ends. You know what the Holy Ghost spoke to me? Now I told you, for those of you who've been watching our Wednesday night Bible study, I told you, you got to understand prophetic ministry versus a simple prophecy. What I'm about to tell you, I guarantee you, is prophetic. Meaning, it is, thus saith the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. I was in my car driving down here to Huntsville to do some work on our new space. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me just as plain as day and said to me, Are there so few righteous that I should have to use the ungodly and the wicked to do my ends. 
said, Are there so few godly among you that I should have to anoint a godless, unbelieving, lying deceiver to do that which I would have him to do? He said, No. That's not the problem. The problem is what the church is saying I want done is not what I am saying I want done. Mm -hmm. You see, the church loves to put words in God's mouth. I'm going to tell you something, folks. People are going to answer to God in their judgment for that habit. You better be real stinking careful about putting words in God's mouth. There's a certain political group in this country that has been taking advantage of and manipulating and using the religious right, evangelicals and fundamentalists. Honey, they've been playing you like a fiddle for decades! And you're too dumb to see it! This foolishness convincing people we are the party of righteousness. We are the guardians of godliness. We're the only ones in America who are interested in doing the right thing. Bull! The truth of the matter is from a biblical perspective there are planks in either platform of either party that are absolutely 125% in keeping with biblical teaching. There are things that the Republicans talk about that are certainly scriptural and godly. There are things that Democrats talk about, that Democrats want to do, that Democrats are seeking to accomplish, that are absolutely without a doubt within the confines of godliness and righteousness. I always have to laugh at people who brag about how America is a nation that is built on Judeo-Christian principles. You're so full of crap. I'm sorry, folks. I don't know how to mince words. I'm sick and tired of people with IQs in the single digits talking all this stupidity and all this foolishness. Honey, that is a pipe dream. That is garbage. That is foolishness. It is stupidity. You have been indoctrinated with that foolishness by false prophets for decades. But it is wrong. How do I know it's wrong? I'll tell you how I know it's wrong. Because God himself designed a government for the nation of Israel. Did you hear what I just said? God himself designed a system of government for the nation of Israel. It originally did not include a king. When the people eventually screamed out and demanded a king, the Lord warned them that a king was a bad idea and that that would backfire on them as sure as they were alive, but they wouldn't listen. But the system of government that God designed for the people of Israel, listen to me now, included provisions for the poor, included provisions for those who sought asylum, mm -hmm. who sought safety within their borders. It included provisions for uh, immigrants and those who would wish to come and join themselves to the nation of Israel. Oh, I'm going to make a lot of people angry, but that's okay. His policy was open border. 
his policy was anyone that wants to come and join themselves to your nation, you are to receive them. And he did not say you're to receive them as second class citizens, you're to treat them. Oh, I'm going to say it today. I, I love making people mad. I love telling the truth and getting people hopped off at me. You're to treat them as modern day Israel treats the Palestinians. Wrong. 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 The system of government that God delivered to Moses at Mount Sinai said that anyone who existed within your borders who desired to be part of your nation was to be received, listen to me children, this is the word of God, was to be received as native born. They were to be treated the same identical way as anyone native born. There are so many provisions that God made in His government that He personally designed for the nation of Israel. There are so many provisions in that government that America would sooner shoot itself in the head than embrace. So don't tell me how we are a Judeo-Christian nation built up and based on the principles set forth by God in His Word because you're a liar and you're full of it. Mm. You want to know what God would expect of a nation? Study what He designed the government to look like for Israel. That will tell you how God expects the nation to behave. I remember years ago I was talking to an uncle by marriage. I used to hold this man in high esteem. I used to think very highly of him. My opinion, I'm sad to say, has changed dramatically. We were talking and I said something about, but the Bible says to care for the poor. The Bible says to take care of those who are sick and those who are in prison. The Word of God teaches that we're to treat uh, refugees and we're to treat those who come to our nation as though they were native born. And my uncle said to me, that's at a personal level. That's not, that doesn't have anything to do with the way a government should conduct itself. Oh, wait a minute. I thought your big selling point was, Mr. Republican, that your religion informs your politics. But when it's convenient, all of a sudden, no, that's at a personal level. That's not anything that's to be embraced politically. That's not anything that's to be employed as part of a, uh, the policies of a government. Really? Study. Study the laws that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. The sect Killer laws he gave Moses on Mount Sinai that were meant to govern the nation of Israel at a secular level. Look at those laws and tell me, mister, how close your party's platform is to lining up with those laws that God himself established at Mount Sinai. Say, Pastor, do you really mean to get up today and preach politics? No, I do not. There's a method to my madness. There's a reason that I'm going here because I don't always go here. I have no interest in going here. Quite frankly, this subject matter makes me just about want to wretch. I'd really rather stay away from it if I could help it. But I've got to make a point today. 
America is on the brink of civil war. I've been prophesying this now for decades. I've been saying it was coming. The reason that it is there, my friend, is because a group of people have allowed themselves to be led astray. A group of people have allowed themselves. Adolf Hitler said you can make people see heaven is hell if you know how to use propaganda, right? I'm going to tell you, there is a political party in this country that has been putting a certain spin on every single cotton-picking thing that goes on everything. They put a negative spin on it. They put a fearful spin on it. And guess who's fallen for it? Hook, line, and sinker. The world, the unbeliever, those who don't know God, no. No. That would be lovely. No. It's the people over here who claim to know God, who claim to be believers in Jesus Christ, who claim to be more than conquerors through Christ, who claim they can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth them, who claim that there is no fear in love, who claim that they embrace the salvation offered by God on the cross of Calvary through the provision of the man Jesus Christ. Those are the people who buy into every single one of these idiotic, fear-inducing, anger-producing, angst-stirring propaganda rallies. It's the so-called Christians. The church's standing in the world is falling so fast right now that our heads are spinning. People are losing all respect for anyone and anything that calls itself Christian. Most churches this Sunday will have spent more time preaching fear and anger and angst than they will spend time preaching how we ought to live as children of God. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to love. And Jesus said, don't you just love one another because even the unbeliever loves one another. Even those outside of the church know how to love one another. Hello now. Say, no, love them that are without as well as loving them which are within. We're supposed to be a people of love. Our trademark, the very thing that ought to identify us as people of God is supposed to be our ability to love. But I've been to church meetings. We went to a camp meeting one time in Texas. I took folks from the church to my old former denomination. I used to love that denomination. Had a lot of respect for it. I thought camp meeting would be a good experience for us. We walked in, we sat down, we sang songs, the preacher was introduced, he got up, and immediately, immediately he began to preach politics and angst and fear, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And I said, let's go, got up, right up out of the meeting and left. That man didn't have anything to say that was going to benefit me or any of our people, and I wouldn't go sit there, waste my time listening to it. God's people are supposed to walk in discernment. God's people are supposed to walk in victory. We know that even when things look their worst in the world, in the spirit, we are yet victors. Hallelujah.
It doesn't matter how many abortions are going on in America. God's church is still going to come out the winner. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how many gay people are marching down the streets of our major cities. It doesn't matter. I'm not talking my my moral judgments. I'm not talking my idea of what is right and wrong, folks. I'm talking about their idea of what is right and wrong. I've got news for you. Instead of them approaching things from a godly, biblical, spiritual perspective, the church today is as carnal and as worldly and as caught up in the negativity and the nastiness and the angst and the hatred and it's all been fed to them by this one particular party. And there's a couple of news sources that have been serving that party's interests now for decades. I have an uncle that I, he's passed on. I adore this uncle. He was a great uncle. Not an uncle, but a great uncle. He was my grandmother's brother. This man used to be so much fun. I used to love to be around him, oh my goodness, he was hysterical, he, he was a blast to be around, he could be funny as all get out, and every time Uncle Eddie was in the room, you knew you were going to have a good time. The last time before he passed away, about a year or two before he passed away, I had the opportunity with Tommy to visit New England and we went by to see my uncle and all of a sudden my uncle had turned into this negative, nasty, hateful, cussing. I, I never saw anything like it in my life. I could not believe what I was looking at. I couldn't believe what I was hearing come out of his mouth. And then all of a sudden he said, well, you know, CJ stands for Chuck Jr. That's what my family calls me a lot of times. He said, well, you know, CJ, I've been watching Fox News. And boy, my eyes have been open. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's awful sad when your eyes being open result in you're becoming nothing but obsessed and angry grievance filled my goodness I could not believe the change in this man when we left I apologized to Tommy for even bringing him there because the experience was horrific it was terrible I remember seeing a while back a documentary by a woman whose father had experienced the same identical change in personality. And she actually created a documentary based on this. And it was for the same identical reason. Her father had begun to watch Fox News. Everything was Fox. Everything, all their commentators, all their hate pushers, all their anger pushers. And all of a sudden she said, my father, who was a sweet man, a gentle man, a kind man, a charitable man, all of a sudden he was spewing all this hateful negativity and nastiness. And she said he became the most angry, hateful, nasty person. I know a preacher's wife that was one of my favorite pastor's wives of all time. Oh, I love this lady. She had the most wonderful spirit same thing I watched her on Facebook in recent years and she began to post one thing after another after another that was so angry and so hateful and so nasty and so negative and then of course she spewed the old Fox News Republican line. You can't possibly be a Christian and be a Democrat. Pastor, why are you talking all this? I'm talking all this so that you understand, folks. Listen to me carefully. 
we need revival in America and we need it bad and we need it fast and we need it now. We needed it yesterday. The church has got to get back on track. We have got to get out of our angst-filled bitter poly uh, political thinking and we've got to get back to spiritual thinking the word of God said for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places our enemy is not gay people our enemy is not drunk people our enemy is not prostitutes our enemy is not women getting abortions my God have mercy our enemy is unbelief what is going to drag souls into a devil's hell are not the issues that you're focused on but the issue of unbelief we're supposed to be preaching he that believeth on me shall never die hallelujah to God we're supposed to be preaching the good news of of the gospel of Jesus Christ and it is good news got news for you if the preacher you watch on TV isn't preaching good news honey he's not preaching the gospel Amen. I don't know what he's preaching but he's not preaching the gospel gospel means good news <sighs> There is more opportunity today for a work to be done by the church in the world in which we live than there ever has been. And do you know why there is more opportunity today for the church to do a work? Because the church has screwed it up. The church has done such a poor job, has done such a miserable job, has messed things up so drastically and so miserably and so terribly that it has left the opportunity for those of us with a mind to do a work for God in these last days, it has left the opportunity for us to do a lot. There's a lot to be done. If I had my way, I would preach this country back into a state of harmony. I would help this nation to understand that where there is division and strife, where people are going to argue and fight rather than accept the outcome of a democracy. See, democracy only works, folks, when people of good will, people of good will, accept the outcome. There have been many elections in my 57, almost 58 years. There have been many, many elections, statewide, national, so on and so forth that I have been very, very unhappy with the outcome of. But never did I ever for a moment think to start preaching we need to take up arms and take our country back and do it the way that I think it ought to be done. But you see, these fools have convinced themselves, Tommy, that they're the righteous ones, that every thought they have is right that everything they want is right and that the other people are wicked and ungodly and they're on Satan's payroll and by demonizing the other and elevating yourself you put yourself in a very very dangerous place do you know how much evil has been visited upon our world in the last two centuries by people who believe themselves to be right and who wanted to demonize the other oh let me give you a little example there were the inquisitions there were the crusades millions upon millions upon millions of human beings were slaughtered in the name of Christ 
because this bunch of folks over here convinced themselves that they're in the right, bless God, and those people over there are wicked. Jews were slaughtered, they were tortured, they were boiled in oil. Muslims were tortured and killed by the million. We're not talking a few hundred. We're talking about over the course of centuries. This same policy carried for centuries. And millions were butchered and millions were murdered and tortured. Folks, that's where we're headed back to if we're not careful. I'm going to tell you a little secret. What Jesus saw in this woman went beyond her having been married several times and now living with a man that she was not married to. Now let me help you understand something. This is where I, it really breaks my heart, but in most sermons that I've ever heard, I've never heard anyone explain this the way it ought to be explained. Marriage in biblical times had nothing in the world to do with going down to City Hall and getting a marriage license and then finding a rabbi or finding a priest to perform a ceremony. That is not how marriage worked in biblical times. Marriage was very much a contract, a commitment between two parties. There was nothing on paper at first. There was no commitment that was assigned to paper. No, a man found a woman, he offered the father of that woman if he had anything to offer, a dowry. If the father accepted the dowry, that young lady became the possession, became the, the spouse of this man. They then would go in private somewhere and they would consummate their marriage. They might have a wedding a uh, reception as such. They might have a wedding celebration. Had nothing to do with a wedding ceremony. There is no wedding ceremony anywhere in the entire Bible. No wedding ceremony is prescribed by God. No, the Roman Catholic Church turned marriage into a sacrament. They're the ones who made wedding, uh, marriage this big thing, okay? They're the ones that turned it into a big religious issue. It was not that way from the beginning. When Jesus looked at this woman and said, you've been married five times, but the guy you're with now, you're not married to. Let me tell you something. He was literally exposing, listen to me carefully, not her legal status with the man she was with now, her emotional status. He was tapping into her thinking. He knew how she felt about the man she now was with. Because marriage was a commitment between two people. She was not committed to that man. He said, you're with him, <laughs> but you're not committed to him. You're not married to him. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, let me tell you, that situation then was not at all like we would call today, quote unquote, living in sin, you know, living together but not having the license. No, 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 no. They were living together, but she was no more committed to him than she was committed to anything. She probably was tired of marriage after five husbands and figured, you know what, I'm sick and tired of giving everything I've got to one man and being fully committed to one man and devoted to one man and, and in the end it never really pays off and never works out the way I'd like it to work out. I'm tired of this mess. So the next guy she found, she approached him with a very different mindset, with a very different thought process. And Jesus knew that mindset. He knew what she was thinking. He knew what she was feeling. He knew how she looked at the man that she was now in a relationship with. That is what was so powerful about the Lord's words to her concerning her current living situation. 
That's what made it so powerful. How could this man possibly know what's in my heart? How could he possibly know what's going on in my head? But you know, it's funny. Even people who aren't always doing everything just right, can have a mind and a heart that's soft toward God. Mm -hmm. This little lady looked at the Lord and after He gave her this revelation, she said, you know, we believe Messiah's coming. And we believe He's going to show us and teach us the right way and the way that we ought to go. Oh, hallelujah. Lady, you may not be the godliest thing in town. You may not be the most righteous thing in town. You may not be the greatest saint in town. But you've got a heart and a mind that is soft toward God. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of people in our community today. There are a lot of people in the LGBT community today. You may not be living just right at the moment. You may not be doing everything, oh hallelujah, just the way you ought to be doing it. You may, you may be doing things and living things you know you shouldn't be doing and living. But at the same time, at the same time, at the same time, you have a heart and a mind that is soft toward God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And I'm sent here to tell you today, God can turn the outcast into an evangelist. He can take someone who really, there's no reason for him to even talk to them. There's more wrong with them than there is right. And he can turn them into someone who's spreading the good news about him. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, what the Lord saw in this little lady wasn't about her marital status. No, what the Lord saw in this little lady was this is somebody who when she learns who I am, when she comes to understand just who I am, she will get excited and share this news with everybody. Hallelujah. That's what the Lord saw in her. He saw a potential evangelist. We read in our primary text today that after the Lord declared Himself to be the Christ, the Word of God said the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. That little lady was responsible for opening the door to the entire Samaritan population. to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus had told his disciples, he said, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils freely, yet receive freely, give. But he gave them one other instruction. He said, but don't go, listen, <laughs> He said, don't go into the city of the Samaritans. Don't go to the Samaritans. Oh, hallelujah. Why, Lord? Are you not going to offer salvation to the Samaritans? Are the Samaritans going to be the only class of people on earth 
who will not be able to be saved. No, that wasn't his reasoning at all. He was preserving that for himself. He said, no, I, I'm going to have a meeting with this little lady at a well. And while everybody else may look at her and see an outcast, I'm going to see an evangelist. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. I told you this message would get on a better track. I had to make a point, though. He said, there's a little lady I'm going to have a conversation with. And let me tell you something. He said, she's going to do a better job. <laughs> of preaching me to the Samaritans than you could ever do. <laughs> She's going to do a better job of representing me to the Samaritans than you could ever do. The Samaritans aren't going to be interested in hearing from a Jew. Oh my goodness. But they'll hear from one of their own. I want to tell you something, folks. There's a reason why this old queer preacher is up here today preaching. There's a reason why I'm up here today preaching. Because there are people in our community, I don't care how positive a message, I don't care how affirming your church. If you're not part of this community, they're not going to hear from you. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? If you don't live their experience, if you don't know what it feels like to be an outcast, if you don't know what it feels like to be abused, if you don't know what it feels like to be looked down upon and talked about and cussed, they don't want to hear from you. But they'll hear from somebody who comes from the same place they come from. Mm -hmm. Hi, that's me. <laughs> Hallelujah, LGBT believer. That's me. I know where you come from, baby, because I live there too. Hallelujah. And I'm here to tell you today that Jesus Christ is still the answer. And oh, there's a work to be done in the world. The church has so defiled its mission, it has so destroyed its purpose, it has so malfunctioned and misrepresented the gospel, we desperately need evangelists today. We need people who can represent it right. We can need people who, we need people who can preach the right message to try to get the church back on the right track. My God have mercy. My kingdom, Jesus said, is not of this world. His kingdom is coming. And when it comes, it's not going to require Republicans doing anything, making any bills push through Congress. It's not going to require any Republican president signing anything in the law in order to accomplish his will. No, when the kingdom of our God is come, honey, you won't have to do a thing in the world. It'll be done and it'll get done by his own hand and by his own power. Amen. God never called us, never, to be a political influence in the world in which we live. Amen. Never, never, never. That is not our calling, that is not our purpose. He called us to preach the good news of the gospel. He called us to declare the Messiahship of Jesus the Christ. He called us to lead men to a place of repentance at the foot of the cross of Calvary. Folks, there's so much opportunity today for us if we have a mind to do right and to do the right thing and to stay on track and to do a spiritual mission. And I'm here to tell you today, no matter how much of an outcast you may be, no matter how much of an outcast you may feel, the truth of the matter today is this. 
our God is able to turn you from an outcast to an evangelist. Amen.